I think all of us would admit that we'd wished we'd had come to Christ sooner, perhaps. After we've tasted of Christ, after we've seen the blessings, after everything so good has come in our life, why would we want to go back? But in the light of what God has done for us, we can stay faithful to God. The sermon is called A Testimony That Comes Across. A Testimony That Comes Across. Let's all turn to Joshua chapter number 4. Joshua chapter number 4. Going from verse 1 to verse number 8. Let's all stand and read this together. Joshua chapter number 4. From verse number 1 to verse number 8. And it says, And it came to pass when all the people were clean passed over Jordan, that the Lord spake unto Joshua, saying, Let's all read it together. Take you twelve men out of the people, out of every tribe a man, and command ye them, saying, Take you hence out of the midst of Jordan, out of the place where the priest's feet stood firm, Twelve stones, and ye shall carry them over with you, and leave them in the lodging place where ye shall lodge this night. Then Joshua called the twelve men whom he had prepared of the children of Israel out of every tribe a man. And Joshua said unto them, Pass over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of Jordan, and take ye up every man of you a stone upon his shoulder, according unto the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, that this may be a sign among you, that when your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean ye by these stones? Then ye shall answer them that the waters of Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord when it passed over Jordan. The waters of Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be for a memorial unto the children of Israel forever. And the children of Israel did so as Joshua commanded and took up twelve stones out of the midst of Jordan as the Lord spake unto Joshua according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, and carried them over with them unto the place where they lodged, and laid them down there. That's great. You may be seated. On January of the year 49 BC, Gaius Julius Caesar would change history forever. He stood on the north side of the river of Rubicon, which was apparently what the northern border of the Republic of Rome was made of. He was warned by the general Pompey and the senators of Rome, do not cross over the river Rubicon with a legion of soldiers. Gaius Caesar looked at his legions, then he looked at the river of Rubicon, then he looked at what was soon going to be the empire that he was going to rule. And then he crossed over. January 10 came, and late at night, Julius Caesar would famously cross over the Rubicon River and begin his march towards becoming the first perpetual dictator of Rome. Within five years, he was going to take the whole empire, and he was going to establish a 1,500-year reign for this empire. When Julius Caesar crossed over, historians claim that he may have uttered the phrase, the die is cast. This crossing of the Rubicon River has come to be known in modern day as an expression, crossing the Rubicon. Maybe you've heard of it. But what it means is going past the point of no return. This marked, this moment in history also marked Julius Caesar as one of the most influential people of all time. You can say he put a testimony for the ages. 
Now, when people look through history and they look at who are the most influential people, Julius Caesar only comes in at 22nd down the list. Do you guys want to guess who is the most influential person? It's Jesus Christ. Right? Julius Caesar, he may have the month of July named after him. But every time there's a new year, we know we've come one year more from when Christ came to earth. You see, as much influence as Julius had, Jesus Christ has influenced the most amount of people in this world. But even when we are influenced by Christ, we're also influencing others also. Right? Paul, in fact, he talks about this in 1 Corinthians 1.11. He says, be ye followers of me, even as I am also of Christ. You know, that's a tall order. Follow me as I'm following Christ. That's a tall order. Because oftentimes we know our weaknesses. We know our, where we fall short. And we feel like telling our kids sometimes or telling people who are following us, don't follow me, follow someone else. Because I know where I'm going to fall. And often we say that kids emulate something even greater than us oftentimes. But you know, that is God's design. God's design is that the younger follow the older. And it's natural. Now, when we look at here the book of Joshua, we know that Joshua succeeds Moses. He comes after Moses to lead the people of Israel. He has a new batch of people. If you remember, the generation that was with Moses, they had wickedness in their hearts. They sent 12 spies and only two of them came back with a good report, Joshua and Caleb. And so Joshua and Caleb were the only ones who were able to see the promised land with this new generation of Israelites. So what he said, he told a specific person of each tribe to grab stones as they were crossing to grab stones from underneath where the river was and to bring it to the other side and to pile them up, to show as a memorial that God is the one who brought us to the other side. The expectation is that this crossing was going to act as a testimony of God's goodness and God's power. The expectation was that this river crossing was a point of no return. There's no going back from this. As Christians, we as well have come through a point of no return. We cannot lose our salvation. And praise God for that. Because salvation, you know, there's nothing we can do to earn it. Salvation was like crossing this Jordan. We had passed from death to life. But the rest of our life is to act as a testimony of God's goodness and power. It's becoming, you know, in our culture today, it's becoming more and more difficult to shine your light. Especially, God wants us to still be able to stand apart and to stand bright and to stand true to what he had taught us. Lines are often blurred today between all sorts of things. Things you may never even have wondered. Where no lines ought to be blurred, people can't tell what genders they are. The lines between the works of people and the works of computer-generated tech is being blurred as we speak. People can't tell a difference between what is a Christian and what is not a Christian. Because sometimes they think that just going to church makes them a Christian. It doesn't. This is where knowing how powerful a testimony becomes useful. A testimony that will come across. How do we make sure that we leave a good testimony for those that come after us? Today we're going to look at what is a testimony from these stones, and then how believers can use that. 
okay? So we're going to pray, and we'll go right in. Our Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for today. Thank you, Lord, for everyone here. And Lord, it is the evening, and we pray, Father, that you'd help us to be attentive, help our mind to be set on your word, help us to be able to understand what is being said. I pray, Father, for anyone here who perhaps don't know you as Lord and Savior. I pray, Father, that they would help, you would help us to help them settle that. We also pray, Father, that you'd glorify yourself in this service. We thank you and praise you. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. The stones were a memorial. The Bible says it, too. They brought large stones from underneath the river, and these were stones you couldn't just find anywhere else. Right? I have a picture of the Jordan River here. Go right after that one. There you go. A nice piece of the Jordan River. The Jordan River oftentimes was about 33 feet wide. How big is 33 feet wide? Well, look at the auditorium this side. Then look at the auditorium on that side. That's perhaps close to about how much 33 feet wide is. But if you know the story, the banks of the river were overflowing. You know what that means? It wouldn't have been just 33 feet wide. It would have been between 90 to 100 feet wide. Now it's getting even bigger. All right? You see, it's not just one stone either that they had to bring. It was 12. Why is that significant? Well, see, the river is about 10 feet deep, maybe. Think about it like this. If they just brought one stone to the other side, perhaps today an atheist would think, yeah, it's just one stone. I mean, a million years, and then the stone will turn into what it is. Okay, two stones. Well, yeah, a million years and a million other years, and you got two stones. But 12 stones stacked on top of each other, now that's a miracle. Because how in the world in nature will you see that? It's interesting because these stones also help us to understand two attributes about God. Okay, The first attribute that we find is the power of God. The first attribute that these testimonies teach is the power of God. The story teaches us of God's power. It was an impressive feat. Think about it. 90 to 100 feet wide of a river, you're bringing 2 million plus people across. Okay. They weren't hiking. These were guys who were bringing their livelihoods with them. They were bringing a giant ark with them. They were bringing supplies to build a tabernacle with them. They were bringing cattle with them. They were bringing other beasts with them. They were bringing their family members with them. They were bringing their tents with them. You see, this issue is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. It was a miracle that they were able to come across. And they did it on dry ground. And you see, what, what's interesting about this whole thing is that even before this, we see God's power being showcased. In fact, where was their next destination? Jericho. And we know that there were spies that were sent there, and they met this lady named Rahab. That lady already had heard of the stories that were taking place with Moses and all these other men. And they had heard how God had delivered them and beat, uh, destroyed the battles and won them victories in these battles. They knew that God was on their side. And they saw the power of God because it's not these average farmers out of Egypt that can just destroy these nations. God had to be behind them. So, we see the power of God. I had been doing a little more research and uh, a couple of months ago I came across this synthetic organist, or organic chemist and I'd been listening to a lot of his works on YouTube. His name is James Tour. You have that picture? That Dr. James Tour. Dr. James Tour, he works with nanotechnology and he has helped in tons of technological achievements and published over 800 publications. Is that a lot? That's a lot, right? 
He placed, he's placed over 130 patents, and he has many other achievements, but he was also ranked in the top 0.004% of the 7 million scientists in the world. This guy is a smart guy, okay? But he has always challenged atheists and origin of life scientists with five fundamental questions. He always puts five questions to challenge atheists to solve the origin of life using the evolutionary model. All Dr. Tour has asked was that the scientists show the chemistry for polypeptides, polynucleotides, polysaccharides, the origin of the specified information, and assembly of a living cell. Now, how many atheists do you know will come up with all that? Zero. Because he's challenged the smartest of the smart people, and none of them have given him an answer. Not a single person has come up with it, because what scientists who know this chemistry know is that those molecules cannot exist for a long time. The building blocks that become those molecules change rapidly. So this whole science fiction of millions and millions of years that will take place in order for life to show up, time is actually against them. That's what he has taught. And he, he's also talked a little bit about DNA. And when it comes to DNA, often we think of DNA as what the information that life form uses to build themselves, right? How many of you have heard that? DNA is the instructions. Well, as it turns out, Dr. Tour explains, thinking of DNA as information is like thinking your flash drive is information. DNA is a container of specific information, but scientists have no clue how the information got there. I didn't even think about it until I was reading that. The more scientists dig into how living organisms have come about, the more they have no clue. It's amazing. The more scientists are realizing that evolution is just a sham. Just imagine how God created. Well, you don't have to imagine. You can actually read about it. He spoke everything into existence. He spoke it all. Let there be light. God made the universe with his words, and he made them all perfect and complete. And the merry miracles that we see throughout scripture and even in lives of missionaries, we see that God is supernatural. God could make the whole world out of nothing, and making the ground dry, that's nothing. If God can make the universe, he can easily dry it up. He can easily dry up the Jordan River for two million plus people to cross over. Easy. Ladies and gentlemen, I think what happens is we often underestimate God's power. Even when it comes to our lives, we forget the meaning of supernatural. And we sometimes try to come up with human explanations for what is happening in our life. You see, even the cross and what it signified for us is immense. God sent his only begotten son to die for our penalty of sin. Christ took upon himself our wrath and he allowed the Father to forgive our sins. Our debts forgiven as far as how the Bible puts it, the east is from the west. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. It's a miracle. Salvation is a supernatural thing. We have a supernatural God. We cannot save ourselves. Only Jesus can. So those stones are a testimony of God's power. But they're also a testimony of God's faithfulness. We see God's faithfulness because we also see that 
how he didn't tell them to go through 10 feet of water, but instead he cleared it up for them. He made sure that everything was taken care of for these, men, these people to make it across. He made sure that he had provided everything for them. A preacher had once said, the will of God will never take you where the grace of God cannot keep you. And there's a missionary I want to talk about. His name was John G. Patton. Anyone here heard of him? John G. Patton. He was a missionary to the country of Vanuatu. And he gave a testimony of God's faithfulness. Patton was called to the regions of Vanuatu, but knew there would be hostilities. One night, Patton and his wife found themselves threatened by hostile natives who surrounded their mission headquarters. The Pattons thought for sure that the natives would burn down their house and that they would burn down the headquarters and kill them both. These natives were headhunters. They prayed, Patton prayed, him and his wife, they prayed inside of their home throughout the night that God would protect them. And they had fallen asleep. The next morning, they woke up. They didn't die. And they had realized that the natives have also gone away. They had no idea where or why they had been left alone. But the missionaries, they, again, they prayed. They thanked God for everything that took place. And then about a year later, what they found out is that the chief of these natives had gotten saved. He'd, he'd believed in Christ and came to Christ. And eventually the conversation came where Patton was talking with this chieftain. And he asked him, do you remember that night when a bunch of natives were coming around our house and they wanted to burn us, they wanted to kill us? You know, we were praying. Do you know what happened? And the chieftain said, yes, yes, we remember. We planned to attack you. We planned to break in. But we had seen an army of giant men in shining garments with drawn swords in their hands surrounding your grounds. Patton and the chief agreed that there was no explanation other than that God had sent angels to keep the missionaries from harm. Quite powerful. It's almost unbelievable, but it happened. God didn't change the way he was showing grace to the Israelites. All the way through, he provided for them. They would complain, and they would say how much they missed Israel, uh, Egypt even. But then God would still give to them food from above. And he would always be there for their needs. See, those stones, they symbolize something about our Savior as well. Jesus, similarly, he doesn't change. Jesus is faithful. Within our lifetime, rarely do rocks ever even change. So it's something to behold. The 12 men chosen by Israel to bear those rocks were to place those rocks at the entrance of the promised land, as if those rocks were there to welcome the visitors. Jesus is also the one that will be welcoming us into the promised land. But 1 Thessalonians 5.24 says, Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. Take it from the man, King David. King David said in Psalm 37, verse 25, it says, I have been young and now am old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. And I think every one of us can attest that God has been faithful to us every morning. God is faithful to his people. Similar to the father in the story of the prodigal son, the father never changed his love towards his son. Though the son took the inheritance and just blew it, the day he came back, the father's love did not wane. It was there, and he ran to him with open arms, ready to bring him back. Such is God's love for us. It is always there. And this helps us to understand what is a testimony that comes across. What is a testimony that comes across? A testimony that comes across is one that speaks of God's power 
and it speaks of God's faithfulness. But the question that needs to be begged, well, what is the testimony for? It was a memorial for the believers. And that's the second point. It was a memorial for the believers. So you see, Joshua and Israel, they confronted the enemies. And they had victories to talk about. They trusted God's power and they trusted his faithfulness. They just did what God told them to do. And they saw God work every single way. But every good leader wants to make sure that the nation which they were leading would prosper and thrive. So, let's turn to Joshua 24. Joshua 4, Joshua enters into the promised land with these Israelites. In Joshua 24, he's about to die. And he's giving a charge. Joshua wants to make sure that the people who come after him know what to do after he was to go away. 24 from verse 11 to 14. It says, And ye went over Jordan and came unto Jericho, and the men of Jericho fought against you, the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Girgashites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, and I delivered them into your hand. And I sent the hornet before you, which drave them, drave them out from before you, even the two kings of the Amorites, but not with thy sword, nor with thy bow. And I have given you a land for which ye did not labor, and cities which ye built not. And ye dwell in them of the vineyards and the olive yards which ye planted not, do ye eat. Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood, and in Egypt, and serve ye the Lord. This is the famous verse. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua tells them to choose. Choose. Isn't it, isn't it weird that Joshua is telling them to choose after they had come past Jordan? You're in the land now, but you got to choose. Why do you got to choose? Haven't we made a choice? We just came across. Wasn't that the choice? No, because though they were on the side of Jordan, temptations still exist. Though we are saved, temptations still exist. We, even though when you became a Christian, temptations still are there. They may have transitioned into this new land, but the old habits may still linger. Which is why I think Joshua reminds them of what happened at the Jordan River so that they could see those stones and remember God's power and God's faithfulness to them. They had to purpose in their heart of whom they will serve. You have to purpose it in your heart of whom you will serve. You know, we are blessed. We have the Holy Spirit living inside of us. And it's there to remind us of things that we, are, ought, we ought to do. I was thinking about a story, and this story came across a few years ago when I had read it. And I thought I would share it here. About 120 years ago, there was a great revival in Wales. As a result of this revival, there were many missionaries that came out of that revival. These missionaries, they really wanted to reach the world. Some of them concentrated their efforts in northeast India to spread the gospel. The region was known as Assam. Assam was comprised of hundreds of tribes who were headhunters. 
Now into these hostile and aggressive communities came a group of missionaries and they got eaten. But another missionary had come by and eventually he had talked with a man and the man had accepted Christ. And the man told his family and the family accepted Christ. And eventually this family was so much on fire for God they were staying within their tribe and reaching out to other tribes, telling them about Jesus Christ. And more of these tribesmen were coming. But eventually, also, the chieftain got word of this. The chieftain was not happy. He brought in a primitive trial, so to speak. He brought the whole family before the whole tribe, and they were in front of the chief, and the chief told the family, recant Christ, or we will kill you. And he had all the archers of the tribe ready to shoot. And the man said, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. Because he has crossed over the Jordan River. The point of no return. Enraged at the refusal of the man, the chieftain shot dead his wife. The wife fell down, and then the chieftain asked again, will you deny your faith, or we will do the same to your children? And the man replied, though no one joins me, still I will follow. No turning back. The chief was beside himself, he was furious, and he ordered the archers to shoot down the children as well. And then the chieftain asked him one last time, recant, Re refuse, repent of Jesus Christ. And the man said, the world behind me, the cross before me, no turning back. And the man was shot dead, then and there, the whole family dead. And the chieftain said to the other families that had converted, this will be the example of what would happen to you as well. But the chieftain in his heart had realized something. Why should this man, his wife, and children die for a man who lived in a faraway land on another continent some 2,000 years ago? There must be some remarkable power behind this family's faith. And I too want a taste of that faith. You all know the rest of the story. It's history. We have a hymn now. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. I've heard of stories of Christians who've been martyred. Their friends were martyred. I've heard of their relatives being martyred for their faith. And yet they still chose to be faithful. We're not held at gunpoint here in Canada to recant. But I know of Christians who have. Not in Canada, but somewhere else in the world. We haven't had family held for ransom but I've heard of Christians who have for their faith. But we have nothing to be afraid of. So, like Joshua, I want to encourage you to purpose in your heart. Purpose it in your heart. There is no turning back. I'm not going to go back towards the world. In light of the miraculous power that God has, and in light of the amazing promise that whosoever includes you and I, let's stay faithful to our God. Let's stay faithful to our God. We have no good reason to live for this world. Like Julius Caesar, who has crossed the Rubicon, we have to understand there is no turning back from here. We're past the point of no return. So we have left the world behind. And now we're looking forward to Jesus Christ the author and finisher of our faith. So ladies and gentlemen, look at the stones that were once brought. We get to serve God who does miracles for his people. 1 Peter 2.5, ye also as, li as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. We can't go back. 
So, at least, let's make it our best. We can't go back. But can we make our life now better? The answer is yes. Here on this side of Jordan. But I don't think we'd even want to go back. Even if we were given the choice. If we'd want to go back. I think all of us would admit that we'd wished we'd had come to Christ sooner, perhaps. After we've tasted of Christ. After we've seen the blessings. After everything so good has come in our life. Why would we want to go back? But in the light of what God has done for us, we can stay faithful to God. Right? So I'm going to conclude. The stones that were brought from underneath the Jordan River, they mark a memorial of God's faithfulness and God's power. And in light of that, we need to stay faithful and steadfast. A testimony that comes across is a testimony that is backed by God's faithfulness and God's power to affect and change the lives of children and other Christians and other believers. I believe that every Christian needs to offer themselves on a daily basis to God so that they could be used by God. As Christians, one of the most necessary things to do to increase our faith so we could have God's power flowing through us is to give ourselves to God. Pastor White had talked about that this morning. And if you missed that message in the morning service, strongly encourage you to take a look at it on our website. But I have this final story. And would you mind putting that picture? Many of you may know of this Scottish missionary and sprinter named Eric Liddell. If you don't know him, don't worry, I'll tell you his story. Many of us may have heard of this Eric Liddell, but what's amazing about Eric Liddell is his example of what is faithfulness. His story was partially portrayed in a movie once known as Chariots of Fire. But even at a young age, though Eric Liddell was the fastest runner in Scotland, he would not compete in a race if it was happening on Sunday. What's amazing is that Eric Liddell was the fastest runner in Scotland. And when the Olympics were asking him to come and compete, and if it was on Sunday, he decided, no, no, I'm going to go to church. So when, when the, one of the Olympic races took place, the 100-meter race, he could have easily won this race, but it was happening on Sunday. He decided he was going to go to church. And one of his teammates had won the race instead, the 100 meter dash. And in 1924 Olympics, Scotland was booing him after he would be done church. He would come out of church and people would call him a traitor because he didn't compete in the Olympics on a Sunday. Well, as time progressed, the 400 meter dash came along. And this was happening on a Tuesday. This is great. So this man, he trained. He trained like it was nobody's business. And when he got to the 400 meter dash, he won. He won. And he got gold for Scotland. Later in life, Eric Liddell would become a missionary to China. Eric Liddell continued to minister to the youth of China and he shared the gospel with them and he started schools and he started a mission center. Eventually World War II came around and the Japanese started to occupy China and what they did was they took his mission center and he, they turned it into a concentration camp of sorts. Eric Liddell, not unlike the other missionaries, he didn't run away. He stayed in China. And he went through the same sufferings as the people of China were going through. In fact, while he was there in the mission center that was turned into a sort of concentration camp, he would lead the people and take their place in certain punishments. This man was an amazing man. And in fact, 
What's interesting is that he stayed and eventually he got a brain tumor and he passed away there. But there are testimonies about him. There was a little girl who was there, who was a missionary kid who also stayed there. And she went through this whole concentration camp experience. But World War II eventually ended and this girl eventually came back to Canada when the war was over. And she grew up to become a pastor's wife. Her and her husband helped plant a church in Chilliwack called Faith Baptist Church. Which was eventually handed over to another pastor. Which was eventually handed over to a pastor that many of us know, Pastor Hoxie. This young girl said about Eric Liddell, even when he had no food, he would give his food to the others. And he was the greatest example of a gentleman. His speech was always with grace. And he talked with the gentlest of voices to everyone. When there were fights within the camp, he would try to defuse it and help people make peace and help them to reconcile. Now that's a faithful man. Sometimes once faithful Christians fall away and they leave the remaining Christians feeling sad. And perhaps that's what Paul felt as well. In 2 Timothy 4.10 it says, For Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica, Crescens to Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatia. See, God knows that we are not perfect. God knows that. But we need to try to do more for Christ. When we fall, it's important to rise up again and keep going. Because others are watching. That makes a good testimony that will come across. So, let me encourage you. Don't give up. Please don't give up. We have a world to reach. So please pick Back up where you left off. Pick up your stone again. And let's make a testimony that comes across. Let's make a testimony together that will one day witness to our children. Let's make a testimony that will one day witness to other Christians. Let's make a testimony that will witness also to the lost. Thank you for watching the message today. We invite you to join us again every Sunday and Wednesday for more inspiring messages from God's Word.